Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, new trouble for San Diego-based Navy SEALs. Why the Navy has taken the unusual step to fire some of the leaders of the elite military force. And a fight over your miles per gallon. President Trump takes new steps to stop California from setting its own mileage standards. California law would respect a tenant's decision to withhold rent if repairs aren't being made. In a time of sky-high rents, what are your rights as a tenant? How one family in City Heights is trying to get help and how others can do the same. The community itself, if they know that there's a need, will go ahead and make sure that that need is met. And we hear from people who call Fallbrook home in the finale of our series, Where I Come From. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Friday, September 6th. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ebony Monet. We begin tonight with more fallout from the Navy. Three top leaders from the San Diego-based SEAL Team 7 have been fired. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has more on the disciplinary action and the public scrutiny to the normally secretive SEALs. Naval Special Warfare Command announced Friday that it was removing SEAL Team 7's top leader, Commander Edward Mason, along with the executive officer and top enlisted leader. Navy spokesperson Commander Tamara Lawrence says the head of the SEALs, Rear Admiral Colin Green, was removing the three senior leaders of SEAL Team 7 over two breakdowns of good order and discipline. In August, SEAL Team 7 was in the spotlight when one of its platoons was sent home from Iraq amid allegations of drinking and sexual misconduct. A month later, the allegations remain under investigation. In July, SEAL Eddie Gallagher was acquitted of the most serious war crime allegations stemming from when his platoon of SEAL Team 7 was in Iraq in 2017. He was still convicted of posing with a corpse on the battlefield. In court, it came out that the team operated a rooftop bar in a country where drinking was prohibited. In reaction, Admiral Green issued a four-page letter in August which called for an end to the ethical drift in special forces. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Thanks, Steve. The threat to homes near Marietta is, has eased as firefighters try to contain a wildfire. Firefighters have kept the size to about 2,000 acres. Containment is now 20 percent. A few hundred homes in the La Cresta and Copper Creek area remain under voluntary evacuation orders. The fire started Wednesday when thunderstorms moved through the area. Rebuilding after California's deadliest wildfire might get a bit easier. Lawmakers have approved a bill that streamlines construction in areas devastated by last year's campfire. The fire destroyed homes in the town of Paradise and surrounding communities, displacing 50,000 people. The bill allows rebuilding efforts to skip some lengthy and expensive environmental reviews. It's now awaiting the governor's approval. Here in San Diego, officials from around the county took a big step today in their approach to building more homes. But KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the vote was far from unanimous. The new approach will mean planning for more growth around public transit. Board members of the regional planning agency, SANDAG, have to decide how to distribute more than 171,000 homes across the county. Agency staffers proposed cities with more transit and more jobs should have to plan for the most housing. Encinitas Mayor Catherine Blakespear says that will help lower vehicle travel and greenhouse gas emissions. It's always painful when we don't agree with each other, and we had a lot of discussion but I think we're on the right track because we have a methodology that the state will approve. It lacks any nuance. It a handful of smaller cities, including Solana Beach and Coronado, objected, saying the housing goals are unrealistic. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Part of our coverage on the housing crisis includes skyrocketing rents in San Diego. Capital Public Radio's Randall White tells us about a bill that aims to rein it in. The bill would limit annual rent increases to 5% plus inflation. Housing built within the last 15 years is exempt to keep it from discouraging new housing construction. The rules would then sunset in 10 years. Sid Lacaretti is president of the California Rental Housing Association and is opposed to the bill. He says it's bad for both landlords and tenants. It doesn't reflect the choice that the citizens of California um, made last year in November with Prop 10, where 56 out of 58 counties rejected a very similar proposal. 
Anya Lawler is with the Western Center on Law and Poverty and has lobbied for the bill. She says a comparison to Prop 10 is unfair. Um, The voters rejected removing restrictions on local rent control policies. This is a statewide anti-gouging and just cause evictions measure. They're kind of in the same ballpark, but I don't think they're similar at all. An estimated 8 million renters would be affected by this bill, which could be voted on by the Senate early next week. Governor Gavin Newsom helped broker the amendments to it. In Sacramento, I'm Randall White. And when it comes to housing, many people simply want a safe and affordable place to live. But in City Heights, some families say they've been given the choice between losing their home or living in unsanitary conditions. KPBS Priya Shreeder looks at their options and what can be done about it. Alulu Kashindi came to the United States as a refugee from Congo four years ago with his wife and six children. I left my country to come to the U.S. because the Maimai militia was hunting me. After a temporary stay at a refugee camp in Burundi, the Kashindis ended up in San Diego. I felt very happy that I would get to live in peace and away from those people that were hunting me. But sadly, their problems didn't end there. Last year, the family moved into this home in City Heights, their third home since resettling in the United States. Do you mind if we do a tour of the house? Since then, they've dealt with a broken window in their daughter's bedroom, mold in their son's bedroom, no trash bins, and the worst of it all, too much cockroach. Yeah. A cockroach infestation. When we're cooking, they crawl into food. When we put food on a plate and step away for a second to grab something in the room, you'll find them crawling onto the plate. So you can see these are really unusual. They say they've made numerous complaints to their property management company, Prime Asset Management. But instead of addressing their complaints, the company began eviction proceedings against the Kashindis. They're among at least a half a dozen families who've said they're living in substandard properties managed by Prime Asset Management. Hey, folks. Hi. Hi. We do not want to be filmed. I asked you to come at 2.30. Tenant's rights lawyer Dan Lickle is representing three of the families. There's no doubt in my mind that the complaints that complaints have been made in this case about these problems, just the response was inadequate. Um, and now what we're hearing from management after these issues have been raised again, now that I've been involved, is we never knew anything about this. And that's not true. Here's what I told Rick. I told Rick 2.30. He didn't listen to me. You guys insisted on coming at two. I'm here. We reached out to the company's president, Jim Purdy, who said that he's unable to respond to questions due to pending litigation. Lickle says tenants have more rights than they think they do, but they need to know the law. California law would respect a tenant's decision to withhold rent if repairs aren't being made. But it's something that needs to be done very carefully because you want to make sure that as a tenant that whatever problem is not being repaired is a serious violation of the warranty of habitability. Another place to turn is San Diego's Code Enforcement Division. Tenants can make a complaint to the city by phone, online, or in person. A building inspector will come do a home inspection about one to five days after you filed a complaint based on the seriousness of the case. Leslie Sennett is the deputy director of the city's code enforcement division. So we have three levels of priorities, and our first priority is imminent health and safety. So we're going to respond to those types of complaints, live exposed wires, um, open sewage, um, unprotected swimming pool barriers. We're going to respond to those within one business day. For the next level of substandard conditions, um, including mold, vectors, we're going to respond within five working days. She says once an inspector identifies the violation, they will contact the property owner to issue a notice of violation or an administrative administrative citation. The property owner then has a certain amount of time, anywhere from a week to a month, to bring the property into compliance depending on the seriousness of the violation. If the property owner doesn't make the necessary changes or repairs, the case can be forwarded to the city attorney's office. Senate says at any given time in San Diego, there are about 3,500 open code enforcement cases being worked by 15 inspectors. That's why we have the priority system so that we can address these and um, 
so far for this year, we're right on time with making sure that we're investigating everything in the timely requirements. Back in City Heights, Alulu Kashindi speaks philosophically of his struggles. I see what the reality is, but I just have to love and live in this country that gives me peace. He hopes that with help, he'll be able to find some resolution with his housing problems. Priya Shreether, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, Hurricane Dorian hits North Carolina as relief begins to arrive in the Bahamas. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Well, we're wrapping up a hot and humid work week, but relief is coming. Erin Kalandra has our weekend forecast. Well, I hope you enjoyed the day today. It's another warm one out there. We have a big ridge and that has allowed all this warm air to come up out of the south. We also have high humidity. Our dew points are around 70. That's really high for San Diego. So hot and muggy. I'm sure you've noticed, but the good news is we'll see some changes over the next couple of days. It's not going to be nearly as muggy and those temperatures will also be dropping as we start to see a onshore flow. We'll get back to our typical pattern with those clouds in the morning, sunshine in the afternoon. For now, the whole southeast is looking quiet. There is some precipitation, but it's far away from us moving to the north. We'll see a clear night, maybe a few clouds around. Still humid for now at 71 for the low in the metro. Oceanside at 64 and Ramona 60 for the low temperature. Mount Laguna at 61 with clear skies. So here we are Saturday. You'll already notice some changes. It'll be cooler along the coast with that onshore flow, but the interior parts, the deserts, the eastern side of the county, it is still going to be pretty toasty out there. So 94 for Ramona, Borrego Springs at 108 with sunshine, and Mount Laguna at 79. Oceanside 82 in San Diego, still above average for now. Sunshine with 80 degrees for the high. Next week, or this weekend, I should say, we still have this big ridge in the jet stream, so that's going to allow us to still see those warmer conditions, not as warm as it has been. And we're also going to see that monsoon moisture. It's going to stay far to the east of us, but the four corners, they could see some storms, and they need it, so that's good news. Here we are this week. I expect to see sunshine, a few clouds around through the weekend and into the beginning of the next work week. Temperatures dropping back down to the 70s, where they should be. We'll see that sunshine inland as well. We go from 90 all the way down to 81 degrees. So that will be some nice relief for you on Sunday. And it remains that much cooler through midweek. And in the deserts from 108, finally, we're down into double digits into those upper 90s for the next couple of days. And in the mountains, it's cool and crisp. Temperatures in the 70s with lots of sun. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Back to you. Thanks, Aaron. Car companies are the latest to be pulled into the legal fight between California and President Trump over mileage standards. President Trump is trying to roll back Obama-era guidelines at the national level, but California has the legal authority to set its own standards. And recently, several car companies announced that they would continue to work with California on its goal. Today, the Trump administration opened an antitrust case claiming the collaboration is illegal. People working to slow climate change track what goes into the air. For a San Diego congressman, that means focusing on super pollutants. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson says those are gases and particles that have dramatic impact on global warming. Congressman Scott Peters and Republican Matt Gates introduced the Super Pollutants Act this week. It seeks to control emissions of black carbon, hydrofluorocarbons, and methane. Those quickly dissipating pollutants are much worse than carbon dioxide when it comes to global warming. The legislation calls for government experts to develop action plans to keep those pollutants out of the air. And that is welcome news to local climate advocates. We can get a lot of reduction in global warming uh, by even cutting the amount of these greenhouse gases in half. Um, so they're kind of the low-hanging fruit of dealing with the climate crisis. Diesel engines like the ones in the truck that you're watching right now are what put a lot of that soot into the atmosphere. And controlling this super pollution can be relatively easy. If all the trucks in California, all the diesel vehicles put filters, you get rid of about 95% of that. If we all do it today, 
they are gone two weeks from now. The whole black carbon heating of the planet, melting of the glaciers, gone. The authors of the bill hope that getting control of these super pollutants will help control rising temperatures. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Tonight, we wrap up our KPBS series, Where I Come From. Over the past couple of months, we've had stories from Imperial Beach and El Cajon. Tonight, we go to Fallbrook, where we asked people what defines a community. We really come to the aid of people if you're in need. This community really rallies around a cause, a person, a family. So, without getting too emotional on that level. A couple months ago, I ran out of gas, uh, just a few minutes away from here, and uh, I was waiting for AAA to come, and within the 45 minutes or so that I was waiting for AAA to get there, I had four different people stop and ask if I needed some help, and two of them I knew, and two of them I had never even seen before. Everyone reach, reaches out and like if someone needs something, there's always someone willing to help you out. Oh, I think I see that on a daily basis. One of my students was in a car accident a couple of months ago, one of my yoga students, and um, so we all kind of offer any support um, and somebody started a meal train. With like the mig migrant education, um, they sort of helped my mom um, who doesn't uh, speak English or anything get us into college. Even the churches, some of the churches I didn't even go to, basically, I would find either baskets of food on my door or I would find uh, some type of, even a fat cash in an envelope one, one time. So it's just in, with nobody saying who left it. Our communities are only as good as the people who reside in it and I'm raising two girls and I'm so blessed to be able to raise them in this environment. So Farmbrook has helped in a lot of ways with my grow, like help my family grow um, and further into careers. It doesn't matter what church you belong to, what color you are, um, the community itself, if they know that there's a need, we'll go ahead and make sure that that need is met. So I, don't, I like that's why I love Fallbrook so much. I wouldn't really want to be anyplace else. We'd like to hear what you think about our series, Where I Come From. Go to KPBS's Facebook page and join the conversation. This weekend, California Republicans hold their party convention near Palm Springs. Capitol Public Radio's Ben Adler says the party faces a tough balancing act ahead of next year's election. Weighed down, at least in part, by President Trump, the California Republican Party lost every prominent race in last year's midterms. They now hold zero statewide offices, seven of 53 congressional seats, a quarter of state legislative districts, and 23.6 percent of registered voters. Jessica Patterson vowed to change that when she was elected as the state GOP's first ever female and Latina party chair earlier this year. Yet the party's convention this weekend features speakers likely to appeal to the GOP's base. Trump campaign manager Brad Parscal, Energy Secretary Rick Perry, and former Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. The convention site is Indian Wells, near Palm Springs, in the height of summer, with temperatures forecast to top 110 degrees. That prompted this tweet from conservative activist John Fleischman, quote, It's an allegory for the political state of the party. We've gone to hell. At the state capitol, I'm Ben Adler. More Americans are earning a paycheck now than they were a month ago. The latest job numbers from the Department of Labor show a gain of more than 100,000 jobs. That includes 25,000 temporary jobs for the next year's census. The unemployment rate remains, a flat, remains flat at 3.7%. New today, the latest job numbers show about 130,000 more Americans are working. And while this is good news, it's lower than expected. We're talking about jobs, a San Diego home building slump, and the cost of possibly violating children's privacy. Here for the Friday Business Report is marketing strategist Miro Kopik with SDSU and Bottom Line Marketing. Good to see you. 
Thanks, Ebony. Good to see you. So jumping right in, talking about jobs, specifically manufacturing jobs, there's some new data out just this week that has some people concerned. What does it tell us? It tells us that the uh, manufacturing index dropped below 50 to 49.1. Below 50 suggests a shrinking economy. And, and the manufacturing sector has really struggled in the last year with the uh, Chinese uh, trade tariffs and a whole host of other factors. Hiring has just completely stopped in the sector. And what's kind of scary if you really look back at it, uh, and people talk a lot about manufacturing, but manufacturing is only 8% of our total employment in the United States and only 11% of our GDP. In fact, what's kind of scary is that the, since the Great Recession, the manufacturing sector has not bounced back uh, from uh, 2009 to 2017 at the beginning. We kind of regrouped and regained a million jobs, and since then about half a million jobs to date. Um, manufacturers um, are concerned about recession, about consumers who have been spending like drunken sailors, but at the same time, uh, when they have to spend a lot more on, on, on goods that now have a 15% tariff on it, um, they're concerned that, that the orders are just not going to be there. So manufacturers are, are challenged, and, and, and we'll, we'll see how that continues to go. At least services had a good month last month. And of course, you're talking about the trade war, the ongoing trade war. Correct. So next up, also down new home construction here in San Diego, and in fact, it's down across the state of California, but especially here in San Diego. What does that tell us? Well, you know, sometimes these numbers are a little bit erratic because total construction dropped 43 percent for the first half of 2019, which sounds like a lot, but most of it is um, multifamily housing, so apartments, condos, things like that, and, and if, if builders do not file a permit in a certain quarter, their units don't get counted. In the next quarter, almost 600 new units will be filed, so that number might change. The real issue is houses. Housing, uh, uh, single family homes declined 26%. The biggest reason for that in San Diego is the lack of space. You can't, there's no more big areas to develop, so developments are much smaller. Housing, uh, construction material costs are up, labor costs are up, and it's hard to afford a new house. And that's why the state, uh, the, the rent control measure that's going through um, the assembly right now, and, and Gavin Newsom kind of approved last week, would kind of cap rent increases to 7%, 5%, cap plus inflation, and um, that, that could be a way to control those prices and make it more affordable to live in San Diego. So we'll be watching that very closely. Yep. Next up, Google and the Federal Trade Commission have reached a settlement in a case involving kids. YouTube, which is owned by Google, is accused of collecting data from videos that would be targeting kids. Um, so what's the significance of this settlement? Well, it's a major issue because there's, a, there's an act called the Child Online Privacy Protection Act that was passed in 2000. It's been in place for 20 years. That really protects children under 13. They have to have the consent of a parent to be marketed to. Google has been working on trying to build their behavioral business. Con marketers really love to understand how consumers behave, not necessarily their attitudes, so they're willing to pay a premium. Mm -hmm. And Google did this uh, uh, for companies like Mattel, who sells toys to younger kids, um, and they were slapped by a fine of $170 million. Um, it's a big fine in relation to the COPA Act, but in, in the greater scheme of things, Google has been fined well over $10 billion in the last uh, 15 months between the European Union and the United States. Um, Facebook last month was fined $5 billion. So there's a lot of pressure on Capitol Hill to look at regulating these social media platforms the same way they regulated traditional media, television, radio in the past. And, and so Google, for a company that's known as, as their motto is do no evil, um, it, it calls into question uh, how they're behaving in the marketplace. Well, that wraps it up for this week's Friday Business Report. Miro Kopik, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Ebony. Questionable reporting about sexual misconduct cases at San Diego Unified, tighter state restrictions on kids' vaccination waivers, and severe injuries sideline NFL players in their prime. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 830. It's a rivalry dating back 97 years and one that has seen one team dominate the other. But for the San Diego State Aztec football team and their fans, 
They're hoping to finally beat the UCLA Bruins in a matchup tomorrow afternoon at the Rose Bowl. The Bruins have never lost to the Aztecs. They've won 21 out of the 22 times they've played. There was one tie. Kickoff for Saturday's game is at 115. Go Bruins and Aztecs. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. We end the show with a performance from the KPBS Midday Edition Summer Music Series by the Prairie Sky Band. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. I am a man and a kind of sorrow. I've seen trouble all my day. Some people.